Um, okay, so the idea is to think about structure uh, for five days. And um, in setting that as the topic, I guess um, one thing that, uh, that I had in mind, or that Petar and I had in mind, was of course um, the contemporary status of our relationship to structuralism. Um, in the mid-20th century, which I think is certainly at least latent uh, in a lot of the work that, um, that many of us do. Um, but the problem is not just our relation to, to structuralism as a kind of, um, I suppose, intellectual movement uh, in the early and, and mid-20th century, um, but also the concept of structure as such, and also um, the problem of how structure works, if you like, um, in cinema, um, in art, uh, and in other practices exterior to, but obviously very closely and intimately related to philosophy, politics, as well. Um, and, and what I want to stress, I guess, by way of opening is um, my sense, anyway, that the concept of structure has no self-evidence. Um, that although maybe it's become a concept that we deploy quite freely uh, in our intellectual work or in our art criticism, et cetera. Um, my own sense of the concept is that, is that it's still not a concept that I, that I feel that I fully understand um, or that it's a concept that each time has to be reconstructed anew and perhaps particularly in its relationship to the concept of form. Um, so it's, I, I'm gonna focus on that, uh, that problem um, in the introduction of my paper. My paper is on uh, Plato's Timaeus but I've written the paper so that the first several pages of it also work as a kind of general introduction to the conference. Um, so without saying too much more, I'll, I'll get started. I guess hopefully there's enough of these for at least people to share. Um, on the handout, what's on the handout, which I don't want you to get too fixated on as I read because it's only, you know, um, I never really explicitly address the handout, but it's just sort of there uh, as, as background. But what it does is um, the Timaeus opens with this count, one, two, three, where's number four, opening words of the Timaeus. And so what I've done here is, um, is lay out the one, the two, the three, and the four, where the one and the two is a system of oppositions that guides the opening of the dialogue. The number three comes into play in the section of the dialogue on the hypodoke, or the kora, um, the theory of space in Plato's Timaeus. Um, and so in that section on the handout, it's the third term on the list which applies to the Kora. Right? So being, becoming, space. So being, one, becoming, two, three, space. Right? So that's the, the way that number three section works on the handout. And then number four is mostly what I'm going to be talking about, um, the structure of the four elements and the structure of the universe. So let me begin. The paper is titled... Where is number four? The place of structure in Plato's Timaeus. The concept of form is central to the history of Western metaphysics, aesthetics, and critical philosophy. In Plato, it establishes the very distinction between metaphysics and physics, differentiating the intelligible from the sensible. In Aristotle, it functions as the primary term in the distinction between form and matter, and occupies an important place in the theory of the four causes, theory of the formal cause. In Spinoza, it refers to the essence of individual things actualizing substance. In Kant, the categories of the understanding determine the form of objects and of experience in general, while beauty in the third critique is a purely reflective judgment concerning satisfaction or dissatisfaction in the form of the object thus determined. In Hegel, Form is uh, relevant to the dialectically integral relation of form and content, which displaces the transcendental separation of form and matter, and then endows the determinations of thought with their infinite movement. In Marx, value must be understood as a form, as form determined, insofar as it is predicated not upon the material scarcity or constitution of the commodity, but rather the socially necessary labor time requisite for its production. For Adorno, the, the historical dimension of the artwork is legible in what he calls its law of form, which separates it from what it is not, yet bears the sedimented content of the social relations from which its autonomy distinguishes it. And in Badiou's materialist dialectic, 
The form returns to its platonic identity with the idea, yet undergoes an inversion insofar, it is, uh, insofar as it is the singularity of embodied procedures that generate the eternity of the idea that they incarnate in the temporal modality of the future anterior. So throughout the history of Western philosophy, the concept of form uh, anchors a series of metaphysical, transcendental, and dialectical determinations of relationships between the intelligible and the sensible, traversing movements of opposition, contradiction, or deconstruction, involving also concepts of movement, matter, content, history, process, and finitude. So how can we locate the concept of structure with respect to the perennial centrality of the concept of form in the history of philosophy. The curiosity of the concept of structure is that it occupies a position of latency throughout most of this history. That is, despite the occasional usage of the term and despite its prevalence in classical Renaissance and modern architectural theory, for example, it does not undergo development as a systematically determined philosophical concept until the 20th century. Neither Plato nor Aristotle systematically develop a concept of structure. The term structura does not appear in Spinoza's ethics, though the term forma and its cognates occur 73 times, according to this paper that I read on the concept of form in, in Spinoza. Uh, the concept of structure is nowhere to be found in the glossary, for example, of the, um, of the terminology of the Cambridge edition of the Critique of Pure Reason. Uh, there's no entry for structure. Um, and the term is not used with any conceptual precision by either Hegel or Marx. Yet we might see from our own vantage point in intellectual history how Aristotle could have deployed a concept of structure to explain the consistency of the four causes, what holds them together, for example, the structure of the relation between the four causes. Or how Spinoza might have used such a concept to describe the co-determination of axioms, definitions, and propositions characterizing his geometrical method. Or how Kant might have theorized the relational structure of the faculties and their formal determination of nature or of aesthetic judgments. And we might think that the concept of structure could have played a methodological role for Hegel in his theory of dialectical discursivity, the structure of the dialectic, or for Marx in describing the integral relationality of his major categories that he develops in the three volumes of Capital. That is to say, their structural coherence. And of course, it was precisely by retroactively drawing a theory of structure from Spinoza and then applying it to Marx, a theory of the imminence of relational causality in its effects, that Althusser developed the concept of structural causality, a concept that might be uh, itself considered an addition to or intervention upon Aristotle's theory of causation, sort of add structural causality to the, to the theory of the four causes. So the systematic development of the concept of structure in the 20th century and the import of that concept across linguistics, anthropology, philosophy, psychoanal uh, psychoanalysis, and Marxist theory has probably obscured the position of latency that it previously occupied, that is, its latent status. It now comes naturally to deploy this term in discussions of ancient and modern thinkers as though the concept always enjoyed the prominent role it has played over the last 100 years, to the point that even those who supposedly disavow the term or disavow the method are characterized as post-structuralists. Uh, consider, for example, the following passage from, of, of this kind of self-evidence of the, of the concept of structure. The following passage from Bas van Frossen's uh, 2008 book, Scientific Representation, Analytic Philosopher of Science. Defending a structuralist epistemology of science, van Frossen turns to Aristotle to exemplify the inaugural philosophical import of structure as what uh, he claims unifies the referential dimension of theories with their methodological coherence. So Van Frossen writes, the insistence on this unity as a hallmark of science, of the, of the referential and the methodological, the insistence on this unity as a hallmark of science has been with us in philosophy since the beginning. In Aristotle, we see a remarkable parallel in his views on drama and on physics. The physics presents us with a view of the structure of nature and natural processes, and also in conjunction with the posterior analytics of the structure of the science that deals with nature. The poetics presents the structure of the human condition and of human action as they are depicted in tragedies, but also the structure of those tragedies that dramatize human existence themselves. So for Van Frossen, structure holds together 
what theories describe with how they describe it, <clears throat> and thus plays a crucial epistemological and methodological role in the history of philosophy. I agree with him, and I think that he more or less accurately describes what Aristotle is doing in the text that he mentions. Nevertheless, Aristotle did not have at his disposal a, coher uh, a coherently or systematically articulated concept of structure that would allow him to describe his own project in the same way. The difficulty thus raised is how to articulate the place of structure in the philosophical tradition without thereby occluding its relative absence from that tradition. Lacan and Althusser discerned a latent concept of structure in the texts of Freud and Marx, and they reconstructed the work of those thinkers by systematically developing that concept within the field of their theoretical legacy. In what follows, I want to locate the implicit place of structure within Plato's philosophy with reference to a single text, the cosmology articulated in the Timaeus. In doing so, I hope to defamiliarize any easy application of this concept to Platonic philosophy, while also theorizing the systematic import of its latency therein. So, Plato's cosmological dialogue famously opens with a scene of enumeration. Socrates counts the three interlocutors who are present and then questions the absence uh, from his count of a missing fourth. So in Jowett's uh, uh, influential translation, Socrates says, opening of the dialogue, one, two, three, but where, Timaeus, is the fourth of those who were yesterday my guests and are to be my entertainers today? Timaeus replies, he has taken ill, Socrates, for he would not willingly have been absent from this gathering. The dialogue thus opens with an incomplete count and with a missing number, the presence of one, two, and three, but the absence of the number four from the scene of the dialogue. Then, if he is not coming, replies Timaeus, you and the two others must supply his place. Certainly, Timaeus assures him, and we will do all that we can. This is a classic instance of Plato's suggestive scenography. And as is sometimes the case, it is what is absent from the, fame, uh, from the frame of philosophical articulation rather than what is present to which our attention is drawn. And in fact, uh, Julie Naplin's um, reading of the, the Phaedra in this volume um, is an excellent example of um, that sort of approach to a platonic dialogue, emphasizing the absence of uh, Socrates' wife um, from the scene of, of the dialogue. The dialogue begins in incompletion with the specification of a structural lack and with a promise to do whatever is possible to compensate for an absence. Since four is missing, three will have to supplement its lack. In his exquisitely attentive reading of the Timaeus, titled Chorology, John Salas draws attention both to the pertinence of the number three in Plato's dialogue and to the absent fourth with which it begins. Noting that the dialogue opens by putting an absence in question, Salas suggests that this question of a missing place uh, implicitly turns the dialogue toward the Cora, the theory of place, from its outset. Yet, as he also knows, the Cora occupies the place of the number three in Plato's text, uh, quite explicitly. And indeed, this is the number with which Salas will be most concerned. He argues that, Quote, the first three words of the Timaeus, one, two, three, bespeak the dialogue as a whole. And he says of the number three that it is this number and the counting numbered by it that will be decisively repeated throughout the Timaeus. Here he is certainly correct. The relationship between the discourses of metaphysics, physics, and that which lies uneasily between them will be consistently articulated as a tripartite structure in Plato's text one that traverses ontological, epistemological, and methodological levels of its theoretical development. What I want to argue is that what is missing from this tripartite structure is precisely the place of structure itself, the concept of structure. Uh, a concept of structure that might play the role of a fourth term, holding together the uneasy relational placement of the other three. In this vein, Salas notes a reference in Proclus' commentary on the Timaeus to the suggestion of Iamblichus, that the absent fourth bears upon the orientation of the dialogue toward the sensible natural cosmos, its treatment of phusis, and therefore the absence of someone fit to discuss the realm of the intelligible, um, the metaphysical. That is, 
there's supposed to be another interlocutor there, but uh, the interlocutor is missing, and they would be the person who's capable of discussing uh, Fusis. Um, more clearly, and in fact, there's a long history of commentary speculating about which, who this might be, you know, who this, who this absent uh, interlocutor might be. Um, so that's not my concern here. Uh, but while it is true that metaphysics is not the focus of the dialogue, right, that rather it's a dialogue about the sensible world, nevertheless, the place of the intelligible and the metaphysical is clearly designated within the three-part methodological scheme articulated by Timaeus. And this is precisely the place of the concept of form, right? the place of the metaphysical. Uh, Timaeus' discourse begins with a classic platonic distinction between the intelligible and the sensible, metaphysics and physics. And a great deal of attention has been paid to the manner in which the theory of the kora, of space, or what Plato calls the hypodoke, or receptacle, um, how that comes to mediate this two-part structure through the introduction of a third term. So what I think has been missing is a clear account of where the number four intervenes in this dialectical development, precisely as a concept of structure that is implied in the dialogue, but, the, but that is not explicitly included in its conceptual scheme, nor in that of Plato's larger philosophical project. As we will see, the place of structure implicitly opens um, at the moment when Timaeus turns from the theory of the Kora to his geometrical description of the, of the four elements, so fire, earth, air, and water. What he describes is the structure of these four elements. Um, and although a consistent terminology to designate this term is lacking, the place that it would occupy where it more precisely articulated does a great deal of work in Plato's cosmological system. While Plato de uh, devotes distinct courses to, the metaphysics, um, to metaphysics and to physics, it is at the conjunction of these two discourses that Plato's Timaeus unfolds. As Alfred North Whitehead points out, this hybridity is proper to the philosophical discourse of cosmology. The conceptual tension between metaphysics and physics determines the system of distinctions with which Timaeus introduces his speech. So quoting from the dialogue, first then, in my judgment, we must make a distinction and ask, what is it, uh, what is that which always is and has no becoming, and what is that which is always becoming and never is. That which is apprehended by intelligence and reason is always in the same state, but that which is conceived by opinion with the help of sensation and without reason is always in a process of becoming and perishing and never really is. Being is distinguished from becoming, intellectual understanding is distinguished from opinion, and reason is distinguished from sensation. <laughs> These binary distinctions dividing the double subject matter of the text along the axis of the rational and the empirical control the development of Timaeus's discourse through its opening section. The classic question of what mediates the relation between being and existence, intelligible form and sensible likeness, that is the problem of participation in Plato, is exacerbated in this text by the assignment of each, the intelligible and the sensible, to a distinct register of philosophical dis discourse. So Timaeus states uh, that in speaking of the copy and the original, we may assume that words, logos, are akin to the matter which they describe. When they relate to the lasting and permanent and intelligible, they ought to be lasting and, unal and unalterable. And as far as their nature allows, irrefutable and immovable, nothing less. But when they express only the copy or likeness and not the eternal things themselves, they need only be likely and analogous to the real words, analogous to the logos. A being, uh, as being is to becoming, so is truth, aletheia, to belief, pistis. So this is again, this is a section of which precisely the, the, um, the referential dimension of the theory is the same as the uh, methodological dimension of the theory. Right. The discourse, the distinction between modes of discourse corresponds to the distinction between what the discourses are about. The logos of being is a discourse of immutable rational certainty, whereas becoming is the subject of an icos logos, a reasoned account uh, that is only likely rather than certain. Several lines later, icos logos will be terminologically transformed into icos mythos, a likely story. Thus, logos and mythos are each tied, in turn, to the merely likely status of speech about becoming. In his application of the term ikos to both the logos 
and mythos of becoming, we can perceive the asymmetry of a potentially tripartite division of philosophical discourse, okay, with logos assigned to the discourse on being, while the discourse on becoming is split between and synthesized by the categories of Icos Logos and Icos Mythos. That is, Plato, he treats these as if they're the same, but the likely story, the Icos Logos, we want it to be, or sorry, the Icos Mythos, we want it to sort of, we aspire to the status of an Icos Logos, right? A likely story that is rational. <clears throat> so Icos analogy, mediates the relation between mythos and logos. Being is to becoming as truth is to belief. So mythos is like logos, insofar it is sufficiently convincing to approximate the truth. An ikos mythos will be an ikos logos, insofar as it is, is, uh, uh, insofar as it is a convincing copy of the rational and the true. So the story has to be convincing. It can't just be any story. Hegel teaches us to be attentive to the four-part structure of distinctions between three terms. There is an opposition between being and nothing at the beginning of the logic. Pushed to the point of contradiction, this opposition produces the movement of becoming. Becoming is the negation of the negation, nothing, understood as the negation of being. Thus, we have a double structure of distinction. Being is opposed to nothing, and becoming as the negation of the negation, is opposed to nothing. In the methodological dialectic uh, of the Timaeus, the structure is the same, but the logic is a little bit different. Logos is differentiated from Icos Logos, whereas Icos Logos is not differentiated, uh, whereas Icos Mythos, sorry, is not differentiated from Icos Logos. Okay. So differentiation between Logos and Icos Logos, and then a treatment of Icos Mythos and Icos Logos as if they are the same. Logos is reason, Icos Logos is reasonable, and Icos Mythos is convincing insofar as it is reasonable and thus akin to reason. So whereas the logic of, of Hegel's dialectic is negation, the logic of Timaeus's dialectic is analogy. In both cases, however, the explicit introduction of three terms implicitly entails a four-part logical structure. One, two, three, whereas number four that is the question we always have to ask when we think dialectically. As we move from the methodological and epistemological problems uh, of the Timaeus toward his story of the physical construction of the cosmos by the demiurge, the structural role of number four continues to be important. In order to compose the world's soul, the demiurge mixes together three different essences. So the demiurge takes being, the same, and the different, and mixes them together. But each of these, in turn, is made up of two components, the divisible and the indivisible. So the first step is thus to compose three separate mixtures of that which is divisible and indivisible within being, the same, and the different, before then combining the results. So step one, divisible and indivisible components of being are combined into an intermediate essence of being, combining the indivisible and indivisible components. Step two, divisible and indivisible components of the same are combined into an intermediate essence of the same. Step three, divisible and indivisible components of the different are combined into an intermediate essence of the different, right? So now we have these three intermediate uh, essences. The demiurge then takes the mixture of the different and combines it with the mixture of the same before combining the result with the mixture of being in order to produce a single new compound, a fourth essence, which is called the soul. So each of these three essences is composed of two aspects, which are combined into three mixtures before these are combined to produce a fourth term. So again, a kind of complex uh, dialectical structure in the composition of the world soul uh, in the Timaeus. And we arrive at number four, right? Being the same, different, and then the soul. The component parts of the soul are then divided into spheres whose movements are proportionate to each other, and these constitute uh, the famous symphony of proportion, which is the corporeal world, according to Timaeus. The unity of the soul and the body of the cosmos 
is a fabric of these proportionate relationships, the soul enveloping and woven together with the body of the cosmos in all directions. This interweaving of the soul and the body has epistemological consequences. One of my favorite sections of this dialogue, through the mixtures of the same and the different, uh, with which it is woven throughout the cosmos, the soul is capable of sensing similarity and difference. Um, that is to say, likeness, analogy. Um, whenever it comes into contact with anything belonging either to being or becoming. So true opinions and true convictions come about through the resonance of the different with statements about the perceptible, while understanding and knowledge derive from the resonance of the same with statements about the intelligible. The soul as a fourth term composed of divisible and indivisible aspects of the same, the different, and being weaves these throughout the body of the cosmos to render it epistemologically resonant, making truth relevant as it applies to both being and becoming. As a cosmological concept, the soul uh, functions as a principle of unity, drawing together metaphysics, physics, and epistemology. But it is in the, the cosmological role accorded to the four elements and in the theory of their physical composition that the place of structure is most centrally, if only implicitly, at issue in the Timaeus. Timaeus first explains why there are four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, that compose the physical body of the universe. The primary two elements are fire and earth, which respectively account for the visibility and the solidity of the cosmos, and these are joined together through the mediation of air and water. Timaeus explains that two things cannot rightly be put together without a third. There must be some bond of union between them. A tertium quid, right? A third thing that binds uh, the other two. Yet in the case of the elemental composition of the physical world, we require two mediating elements between fire and earth in order to uphold the three-dimensionality of the cosmos. It's a somewhat obscure aspect of this theory. It's because the cosmos is three-dimensional we have to have two things in addition to fire and earth to combine uh, fire and earth together. If it were two-dimensional, we would only need one, Plato says, Timaeus says. Okay, so here's, according to Timaeus, if the universal frame had been created a surface only and having no depth, a single mean would have sufficed to bind it uh, together itself and the other terms. But now, as the world must be solid, and solid bodies are always compacted not by one but by two, God placed water and air in the mean between fire and earth and made them to have the same proportion as far as was possible. As fire is to air, so is air to water. And as air is to water, so is water to earth. And thus he bound and put, toge to put together a visible and tangible heaven. And for these reasons, and out of such elements which are in number four, the body of the world was created and it was harmonized by proportion and therefore has the spirit of friendship, Timaeus says. And having been reconciled to itself, it was indissoluble by the hand of any other than the framer. The physical solidity, consistency, proportionality, and indissolubility of the cosmos thus depend upon its quadripartite elemental composition, which endows it with the spirit of friendship. Again, four is the number of compositional cohesion in the dialogue. It's following his enumeration of the elements in his account of the genesis of the world's soul that Timaeus inaugurates a second beginning of his story. And here he develops a theory of the Kora as a third kind, mediating between being and becoming. In addition to the intelligible model and the sensible copy, there is a third kind that he refers to first as hypodoke, receptacle, and then as Kora, space. Moreover, while being is grasped by reason and becoming is perceived by the senses, the Kora must be apprehended by a kind of bastard reasoning, logos nothos, um, which literally means yeah, bastard reasoning. Uh, the subject of influential commentaries by Kristeva, Derrida, Salas, and most recently, um, Emanuela Bianchi in her outstanding book, The Feminine Symptom, Plato's Chorology uh, will not be my focus here. But here I would question Salus's judgment that the first three words of the Timaeus, one, two, three, bespeak the dialogue as a whole. It is indeed the case that amid his account of the Kora, Timaeus summarizes his discourse thus far by affirming his verdict that being in space and generation 
these three, this is a quotation, so being, space, and generation, these three, existed in their three ways before the heaven. Um, the Korah, space, adds a mediating term to the split between physics and metaphysics uh, from which the cosmology initially sets out. But no sooner does Timaeus thus arrive again at the number three than he proceeds again to the number four, to the genesis and the structure of the four elements. So this is Plato's famous account of the structure of the elements and also of the cosmos as a whole, as modeled on the geometry of what have come to be called the Platonic solids. Fire, so this is what you have on your, on your handout at the bottom. Uh, so fire has the geometry of the tetrahedron, earth of the cube, air of the octahedron, and uh, water of the icosahedron. While the totality of the cosmos is said to have the geometry of the dodecahedron. Now, this fifth geometrical figure is curiously mentioned as kind of afterthought, while Timaeus focuses account on the geometry of the four elements, so perhaps there's a missing fifth in the dialogue as well. <clears throat> um, but the account is focused on, on these four. Each of these can be constructed on the basis of two elementary right-angled triangles, right? So these geometrical figures can all be constructed on the basis of these two kinds of triangles. The isosceles half equilateral and the scalene half square. Right? Both of which in turn obey the structural principle of the Pythagorean theorem. So we might say that the theorem is the geometrical idea or form grounding the composition of the triangles, while the triangles themselves combine to form the three-dimensional structure of the elements from which the physical matter of the world is composed. One could devote many pages to the details of Plato's geometrical construction of the elements and their interrelations, as to A.E. Taylor and Francis Cornford in their important commentaries. But here I'm interested not in summarizing the geometrical details, but in the philosophical concept that should be assigned to the place of this geometry in Plato's cosmology. As I've suggested, I think that this is the place of the concept of structure in the dialogue. And I think that we can add um, that term to the other three articulated by Timaeus as the fundamental concepts of his cosmology. So in addition to being, becoming, and space, there is structure, number four. And this is the answer to the question, where's number four, with which the dialogue opens? What is the significance of this answer for Plato's philosophy? When Timaeus turns from the Kora to his geometrical description of the four elements, he says in Jowett's translation, and now I will endeavor to show you the disposition and generation of them by an unaccustomed argument. The key terms here, translated as disposition and generation, are diataxis uh, and genesis, um, translated by Jowett as disposition and generation. For diataxis, Liddell and Scott's lexicon um, also has disposition or arrangement. Cornford uh, translates the term as formation. So this is diataxis, it's formation. Both Desmond Lee and Donald Zale translate it as structure. Um, these are the two sort of most important contemporary translations, uh, the Penguin and the Hackett translation. Translate diataxis as structure. So several paragraphs later, as he turns from elementary triangles to their combinations in elementary bodies, Timaeus tells his interlocutors, uh, I have now to speak of their several kinds and show out of what combinations of numbers each of them was formed. He then deploys a different term in the same context as he had earlier used diataxis. In Jowett's translation, he says, of these several kinds, the first will be the simplest and smallest construction, where construction translates the, terms, uh, the term sunistamenon, um, which Liddell and Scott translate as a verb, to set together, combine, associate, unite, or band together, sunistamenon. Cornford has, first will come the construction of the simplest and smallest figure, and Lee follows Cornford's translation exactly, whereas Zale gives us, leading the way will be the primary form, the tiniest structure. So Zale thus translates both diataxis and sunistamenon as structure, designating both the act of constructing the figures and the geometrical configuration in which they are constructed, right? To structure, um, to arrange. 
This is an apt choice, this translation is structure, I think, but it also obscures the discrepancy of Plato's conceptual terminology, right? He's using two terms, where Zale only uses one. A discrepancy due to the fact that Plato does not have a consistent concept for the consistent referent of his discourse, right? He's referring to the same thing, what you could translate as the structure of the elements, but he has an inconsistent vocabulary for doing that. Why, in my opinion? Because he doesn't have a concept of structure. I mean, he's not talking about form, clearly, because that's intellectual and metaphysical, and here he's talking about physical composition of the elements. The problem with this usage in a platonic context, oh, hold on, sorry. Uh, interestingly, Zale deploys the term form in the second passage quoted above as an equivalent term of structure. And in fact, Plato does deploy the term um, eidos in this way uh, in the dialogue. So the Greek is, uh, for that passage that I just cited, the Greek is proton eidos kai smikrotaton sunestamenon. Okay, proton eidos, first form, kai smikrotaton sunestamenon tiniest uh, structure. So this could be directly translated, hewing as possible, uh, as close as possible to Liddell and Scott's um, uh, lexicon as primary form and smallest assemblage. So form and assemblage, or form and construction, or form and structure are here deployed as concepts with the same reference. Uh, primary form and smallest structure would be Zale's translation. But the problem with this usage in a platonic concept is that it is philosophically equivocal, and particularly within the methodological space of the Timaeus, where these distinctions um, are emphasized in some detail. The term eidos, which occurs a number of times in the account of elemental geometry, is either used casually, right, um, in the way that we might say, like, uh, you know, the form of this book, um, without using that as like a systematically determined philosophical concept. So it's either used casually, or it should be reserved for pure intelligible forms of being that are not subject to becoming or transformation. And it's difficult to tell which is the case uh, in Plato's usage of this term in this section. But the account of the geometry of the elements is clearly a story about their genesis, of their formation by the demiurge's physical rather than physical, uh, metaphysical entities. Indeed, the geometrical foundation of the elemental structures, the shared basis of the, two primar uh, of the two primary triangles, enables several of them, with the exception of the cube, to transform into one another. This is the point of the two triangles composing all the different elemental structures. They can like, fall apart and recombine into one another, except the cube. Um, <clears throat> The three-dimensional forms can fragment into their triangles and recombine into different bodies. So since these are bodies, they are not purely ideal forms. Significantly, though, they are also bodies that are so small, smikrotaton sinestamenon, that they are invisible, right, which violates the epistemological criterion of visibility that is normally applied by Plato to physical things. These are physical entities that are not sensible entities. They are insensible entities that are not metaphysical forms. So they have an equivocal status in Plato's epistemology. In apparent violation of Plato's carefully articulated re uh, relationship between physics, uh, metaphysics, physics, epistemology, and methodology, these are assembled forms, both eidos and sunestamenon, insensible forms that are susceptible to the processes of generation and transformation that should be reserved for the realm of the sensible. Both the terms diataxis and sunestamenon encode a suggestion of this ambiguity in their function as either nouns or verbs. A structure is structured. An assemblage is assembled. In the Timaeus, the four elements are liminal beings. Before they were put in order by the demiurge, there were traces of them, Timaeus says, scattered throughout the receptacle, the hypodoke. Um, in which its movement sorts into regions of likeliness and difference according to their inchoate qualities. At this point, quote, before they were arranged so as to form the universe, the elements were without reason and measure, e logos kai e metros, without reason and without measure. 
The four elements are, the, are thus both prior to and products of creation, or uh, of Genesis. They exist initially as inchoate qualities, and then as quantitatively determined bodies. Once the demiurge has, quote, fashioned them by form and number, ida si, uh, te kai arithmos, right? So form and number. Diataxis thus inhabits the exact point of coincidence between structure and genesis, the fashioning according to form of the primary constituents of physical bodies. The concept of diataxis either binds together or falls into the rift between metaphysics and physics. In this, it is similar to the receptacle, or the kora, which also evades the binary of being and becoming. Yet unlike the kora, the formation of the elements is geometrical, ordered, and quantitatively determinate. Moreover, the qualities of the elements, and thus the qualities of the entire physical world which they compose, are also determined by their quantitative determinations. So fire is hot because the tetrahedron is the sharpest geometrical structure of the solids. Uh, water is smooth because the icosahedron is the roundest. Uh, earth is solid because the cube is stable. Um, diataxis, or sunistamenon, structure, disposition, arrangement, entails a synthesis of quantity and quality, which is precisely how Hegel defines measure. So this is the, the, the er act of measure, right, in the genesis of the physical world, is this combining of uh, the uh, quantitative structure of the elements with their qualitative properties, which is their, well, their shape morphologically, but more exactly, I would say, their structure. The geometry of the elements is the primary measure of the physical world, and indeed the genesis of their structure is the genesis of measure itself. My argument is that Plato's terminology is embroiled in ambiguity because he does not have a concept of structure, a consistently determined sense of such a term that runs throughout his philosophy, and thus he uses a number of different terms to designate its place. But this place is absolutely crucial because both the content of his discourse on the significance of elemental geometry and the ambivalence of his conceptual terminology, shifting between form and structure or assemblage, suggests that structure is the place of participation in, uh, in Plato's Timaeus. The genesis of the structure of the elements is the genesis of structure itself, and thus of a relationship of likeness between metaphysical forms and physical bodies, between being and becoming. The Kora, space, is the medium of this genesis, the medium of participation. But to understand how and why it is the medium of participation, we need to move from one to two to three to four, from being to becoming to space to structure. As Timaeus says, for these reasons and out of such elements, which are in number four, the body of the world was created and it was harmonized by proportion and therefore has the spirit of friendship. The spirit of friendship alluded to here is not only the cohesion of physical bodies among one another, but also the participation of their particularity in the universality of the forms. And this spirit of friendship is embodied as structure, understood as the unity of form, quantity, and quality, at the unity of those three. Structure is the minimal physical correlate of metaphysical form. But structure is also a concept with methodological implications. The philosophical discourse of cosmology unfolds at the intersection of the rational and the empirical. And structure is the site at which the rationalist and the empiricist dimensions of science are conjoined as the synthetic coherence of the intelligible and the sensible. This synthetic coherence is epistemologically secured and it's methodologically tested by the mathematical formalization of physical organization. If this was incipiently the case for Plato, as the Icos Logos of the Timaeus makes clear, it is entirely the case for modern and contemporary science, in which the consistent relationality of equations is tested by experiment, and in which the empirical findings of the laboratory are vetted by criteria of mathematical consistency within the formalized field of physical theory. This relation of dialectical coordination and reciprocal critique between the rational and the empirical through the mediation of formalization 
was the epistemological framework of the incipiently structuralist theory of science developed by Gaston Bachelard in the 1930s and 40s. In the New Scientific Spirit, uh, 1934, he argues that we need to move beyond the primacy of the Cartesian subject in the theory and practice of science by learning, quote, to measure precisely the limits of our thoughts and to match in a strict and rigorous manner thought to experiment, noumenon to phenomenon, rather than allow ourselves to be misled by the deceptive appearances, by the deceptive appearance of substances, both subjective and objective. We do that now, right? Match thought to experiment through the mediation not only of mathematical formalism, but also complex instrumentation, technology, uh, both of which, mathematical formalism and the instrumentation of the laboratory, both of which not only filter the immediacy of sensible intuitions, but also constrain the generalizations of pre-existing mathematical determinations. For Plato, Euclidean geometry organizes the rational field of application uh, to the thinking of physical qualities through the mediation of plausible, or ICOS, structural determinations of matter. Consider Whitehead's evaluation in 1920 of Plato's degree of success in attaining, in attaining this kind of plausibility, um, right? A plausibility of the relation between the structure of matter um, and uh, the thinkable. Whitehead says, in the Timaeus, Plato asserts that nature is made of fire and earth with air and water as intermediate between them, so that as fire is to air and air is to, so is air to water, and as air is to water, so is water to earth. He also suggests a molecular hypothesis for these four elements. In this hypothesis, everything depends upon the shape of the atoms. For earth, it is cubical, and for fire, it is pyramidal. Today, physicists are again discussing the structure of the atom and its shape is no slight factor in that structure. Plato's guesses read much more fantastically than does Aristotle's systematic analysis, but in some ways they are more valuable. The main outline of his ideas is comparable, ICOS, right, with that of modern science. That's Whitehead in 1920. It's the emphasis of Platonic cosmo uh, cosmological theory upon structure that renders it comparable, ICOS, to 20th century science, and the likeliness of physical theory its aspiration to the status not just of opinion, but true opinion, um, if not absolute truth, is vetted by the plausible cohesion of geometrical principles with physical traits and relationships. The latent but not systematically developed concept of that cohesion, provided neither by the rational theory of forms nor the empirical theory of the sensible, is structure. But finally, what exactly is the status of these ideal geometrical formalizations, which Plato speculatively coordinates with the phenomenon of the physical world, or phenomena of the physical world, as the elementary structure of matter? What's the status of these, uh, yeah, ideal geometries themselves? There is no story of the, the genesis of geometry itself in the Timaeus. Its formalisms are already available to the demiurge who structures the minimal constituents of material bodies after their model. In the framework of the dialogue and indeed of Platonic theory more generally, these forms are eternal. Uh, but this will not suffice for what I would call a rationalist empiricist approach to the philosophy of scientific knowledge. That is one which uh, reciprocally tests the rational against the empirical and vice versa. Geometry does indeed have a material genesis. It has a history. The problem of the genesis of this history, of the possibility of the historical transmission of geometrical ide idealities, for example, from Euclid uh, down to us, and thus of the relation between structure and genesis within the field of geometry itself, is precisely the problem addressed by Husserl in his late text, The Origin of Geometry, it's 1936, and by Derrida in his early introduction to Husserl's essay, uh, 1961. Indeed, this introduction is, is uh, Derrida's most lucid and consequential encounter with the famous problem of structure and genesis, through which the histories of structuralism and deconstruction intersect. In this text, 
Husserl emphasizes the constitutive importance of written signs in the transmission of geometrical knowledge. So without assigning the origin of geometry to the agency of writing, Husserl does note that there is a passive genesis involved in the reception of written signs, whereby what is transmitted and legible as writing is, quote, passively awakened and can be transformed back, so to speak, into the corresponding activity. Right, so you can look at these geometrical forms and you can uh, reconstruct the way that the triangles make them up. <clears throat> this capacity for reactivation, Husserl argues, belongs originally to every human being as a speaking being. Accordingly then, the writing down affects a transformation of the original mode of being, of the meaning structure, within the, ge within the geometrical sphere of self-evidence, of the geometrical structure which is put into words. It becomes sedimented, so to speak, by this writing down. But the reader can make it self-evident again, can reactivate the self-evidence, can take it up as an ideality. It is not just structure, but written structure that constitutes the condition of possibility for the sensible transmission and intelligible reactivation of geometrical idealities, according to Husserl. In his introduction to this text, Derrida notes that, quote, by absolutely virtualizing dialogue, writing creates a kind of autonomous transcendental field from which every subject can be absent. Major proposition in Derrida's early writing. And he then devotes to Husserl's remarks on written signs uh, a declarative paragraph that constitutes, I would say, that constitutes the field of grammatological research as an investigation of a transcendental field without a transcendental subject. This is what Derrida says in this text uh, quite explicitly um, in this very important paragraph. So he says, in connection with the general uh, signification of the epoche, the phenomenological bracket, uh, Jean Hippolyte invokes the, uh, the possibility of, quote, a subjectless transcendental field. He attributes this to Hippolyte. Uh, one, which, one in which, quote, the conditions of subjectivity would appear and where the subject would be constituted starting from the transcendental field, unquote. That's he believed. Now, Derrida, writing as the place of absolutely permanent ideal objectivities and therefore of absolute objectivity certainly constitutes such a transcendental field. And likewise, to be sure, transcendental subjectivity can be fully announced and appear on the basis of this field or its possibility. Thus, a subjectless transcendental field is one of the conditions of transcendental subjectivity. It's an overturning of the Kantian framework of transcendental philosophy. So the import of this paragraph is that it displaces the constitutive status of the transcendental subject in formulating mathematical ideologies, or <laughs> idealities, in formulating mathematical idealities into the transcendental field of writing as a condition of possibility for the production and transmission of formalizing thought. Here we encounter a theme that also marks Badiou's early work uh, during the period of his involvement with Cahiers pour l'analyse. Uh, in Mark and Lack, 1969, he famously describes science as the psychosis of no subject, and hence of all, universal by right shared delirium one has only to maintain oneself within its order to be no one, anonymously dispersed in the hierarchy of orders. Here, science is the dispersion of the subject into an anonymous transcendental field that forecloses, for Badiou, the unity of consciousness through its ramified stratification of discrepant orders of formalization. The subject enters into the field of formalization, the stratified layers of mathematical determination and their relations to one another, and is, as it were, lost therein and simply following the chains of signifiers among the levels of the formalization. Um, that's what Badiou calls the psychosis of no subject or shared delirium, precisely the rationality of mathematical thinking as it's sort of uh, forced by the relationships between formalizations and our capacity to follow them. At the end of that essay, he writes, science is the veritable architheater of writing. Traces 
erased traces, traces of traces, the movement where we never risk encountering this detestable figure of man, the sign of nothing. What Derrida and Badiou share in the 1960s is an anti-humanist theory of, of scriptural formalization, written formalization, as the displacement of the subject of consciousness into the historical movement of rational inscription. For example, the historical transmission of geometrical idealities by writing. At the crux of the structuralist project and of its discrepant legacies, we thus find a theory of written formalization as the condition of possibility for the production and reception of mathematical structures, and thus for the subjective consciousness of geometrical idealities. To a degree, this is in accordance with Platonic theory, since the existence of the forms is certainly anterior to subjective consciousness of their universality. They are prior to transcendental subjectivity, they're eternal. Um, but a theory of the dependency of mathematical ideas on the historical transmission of written signs is more or less alien to Platonic theory and reinscribes Platonic theory within a materialism of the idea. Derrida displaces the Husserlian question of the origin of geometry, the problem of its singular point of genesis, into a plural genesis of signs through which the capacity for geometrical thought is constructed. As Badiou aptly puts it, an architheater of writing traces, erased traces, traces of traces. The place of structure in Plato's Timaeus is the place at which the already inscribed structure of geometrical idealities is inscribed at the intersection of the rational and the empirical, metaphysics and physics, and at which the capacity of such structures to unite quantity and quality within an icos mythos, a likely story, is the very condition of plausible rationality, of an icos logos that is neither relativistic nor absolute, but rigorously coherent and thus subject to revision. The development of a materialist scientific structuralism, which is how I would characterize the agenda of Bachelard's early epistemological writings, has its implicit genesis in Plato's cosmology. One, two, three, four. Thanks.